Hello and welcome to the second part of my interview with Michael Gerber, the author of A Myth. I highly recommend you to watch part one if you haven't done so. And on part one, Michael spoke about the essential skills for any entrepreneur, which are concentration, discrimination, organization, innovation, and communication. So if you haven't watched part one, please search for the link in the description of this video or somewhere on the screen. And now you can enjoy part two of the interview. Thank you. Are you worried about uh, concentration on the new generations? Are we uh, losing ability to be present because of so many interruptions? And what are the tips you can give to the entrepreneurs that really uh, need to understand the concentration as the gateway to the, all the other skills. But of course, and that, the, the, what I just described, this, the five essential skills are really a process. Um, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, a continuous process. Because we are never truly, fully, competent, never truly, fully a master of any of those skills. So continuous improvement is a critical component of working on ourselves, just like I've said, we must learn to work on our businesses as opposed to in them. So entrepreneurs, great entrepreneurs, go to work on the idea they have and create a revolution oftentimes through that idea by working on the enterprise that communicates that idea and in fact resides at the heart of that idea just as apple did just as google does and on and on and on and on and today what you've just spoken to though our young people are becoming less capable of concentrating because they are so distractible. So with the, the advent of new machines and AI and the drive to mechanize everything so that human beings are in fact unnecessary to the entire process, witness the singularity, we are driven by a premise that in fact annihilates the effectiveness of ordinary people. We must counter that. And by awakening entrepreneurs within everyone, we have a hope of countering that. And that's what we do at Michael E. Gerber Companies. Awesome. And Michael, um, everybody's talking about innovation, especially on the startup scene. And then, as you said, new technologies, it's all about innovation. But as you describe innovation, it's uh, further down on the process before, before innovate, uh, correct if I'm wrong, you need, you need to master the, the art of concentrate and uh, discrimination and organization. Uh, can you give us some specific tips, very practical tips that entrepreneurs can apply to identify on their life symptoms that they need to work those skills, at least those three primary skills to get the right to be in, in a position where they can innovate? But of course, but of course, they're essential skills. They're not just skills you'd like to have. They're absolutely fundamental. And so if they're fundamental, and we've proven that over and over and over and over and over again, that they are fundamental, uh, fundamental to being successful at anything that one chooses to pursue, um, then of course, they're necessary, absolutely necessary, a prerequisite to growth a prerequisite to pursuing anything higher. 
And that's what we teach and that's what we believe in and that's what we've done over these past 45 years um, in the career that I've pursued um, to become what is now thought of as a thought leader in the world of entrepreneurship and small business development. And um, uh, uh, for, for example, here on, on our program, we advocate that um, meditation, for example, it's a good exercise to train your, your brain, your physical ability to get concentration. Do you agree with that? And you have other tips you can, you can share with us? But of course I agree with that. Uh, effectively, meditation is simply the art of going within. Meditation is simply the art of going within. Going within and not going out. So it all starts inside, not outside. But in order to be inside fully, um, meditation is critical. So you might say it's the art form of silence. Um, meditation is the art form of silence, not the art form of order, not the art, art form of creativity, but the art form of silence. To be within silently. And to be able to master that is exquisite. And that exquisite mastery creates the room in that silent space um, for what we call um, a blank piece of paper and beginner's mind. And so yes, beginner's mind is critical. And beginner's mind is that mind that is not agitated, but silent. And silent in the space to receive whatever is coming within in a way that doesn't conflict with it, but simply accepts it. And that silent mind accepting all that comes to us enables us to see it in a way that enables us to move it silently. So yes, it's a beautiful thing that you're speaking about, a very beautiful thing that you're thinking about, and one that every single human being on this call um, could and must take in to see the true beauty of it. I would like to, to ask you kindly if you could share the analogy that you do with your uh, uh, music as a musician, as a professional, almost professional uh, saxophonist. And uh, if you could share the analogy of the, the training, the necessary training. And uh, I remember you said once that you don't make music. The music will find you. All you have to do is trust the process and practice. Well, it was very, very simple. When I met my um, saxophone teacher, when I was 11 years of age in Hollywood, California. My mother and father drove me there because my previous saxophone teacher um, told us when we moved from New Jersey to California that we should look up his saxophone teacher. And the saxophone teacher's name was Merle Johnston, a great saxophonist from the 30s um, here in our country. And uh, so we went to look up Merle Johnston, and we did. And my mother and father were standing there with me in this rather shabby little studio of his. And I'll never forget the man because he was no taller than I was, and I was short. I'm short now. I was short then at 11 years of age. But he was six times as wide. He was a short, very, very puffy, red-faced little man who essentially said to us after listening to me for about a minute <clears throat> as I played my horn um, to something that he asked me to play, he said, well, I'll take Mikey in a very derogatory way because he didn't teach kids. He taught professionals. 
I'll take Mikey, but they're rules of the game. I only teach people, he said, who want to become the best saxophonists in the world. In short, you have to be driven. You have to be driven to be the best. And in order for that to happen, you have to practice. And you have to practice what I tell you to practice, how long I tell you to practice, how I tell you to practice. And then you come up every week on Saturday and get beat up by me. You practice three hours a day, five days a week for the privilege of coming here and getting beat up by me. He said, so that's the first rule. Second rule, he said to my parents, is you don't get to come here with Mikey, nor do you get to drive him here. He's gonna have to take the bus. And he handed them the schedule for three buses. It took three buses to get from where we lived to where his studio was. And he is saying, I had to come there alone at 11 years of age. The third thing he said is, this will be the last time I'll ever speak to either of you, to my parents. If little Mikey decides he wants to go through this grueling routine, um, it's between him and me. No parents allowed. I can't abide parents, Merle said. And then he said, so what do you think? And so every indication from my father and my mother was, we're getting out of here. For whatever perverse reason, I wanted to do it. So we decided, yes, I'm going to start studying with Merle and see what happens. Well, I got to tell you, in the first week, I didn't practice three hours a day, five days that week. I didn't because I was special. You understand, I knew I was special. I knew it was really good for an 11-year-old saxophone. So I practiced maybe four or five hours, I don't know. Went up to, on the buses to Hollywood, California, to the corner of Melrose and Western, where Merle's studio was. Walked in his studio, sat down in the red moldy chair where all the students sat while they waited for the previous student to get done. Previous student gets done, the guy must have been 100 years old. I have no idea why an old man would be studying the saxophone. He wasn't that old. I was 11. He was probably 19. What can I tell you? But he got done, and Merle calls me in, puts the music up on the stand, says, <clears throat> let me hear what you did. I start playing. It wasn't more than a minute. He says, stop. Put your horn away. Go back to the red chair. I'll be out in a minute. I did. Sat down in the red chair. Merle comes out and says, stand up. I stood up. He said, what did I tell you last week? Don't tell me, I'll tell you. I told you I only teach people who want to become the best saxophone players on the planet. I told you in order to do that, you're going to have to practice. You're going to have to practice what I tell you to practice, how I tell you to practice, and for how long I tell you to practice. And the first freaking week, and he didn't say freaking, the first freaking week, you blew it. You didn't practice. And that's one. And he said, there is no two. Go home, make up your mind, not whether you're going to practice or not, because that's not even an option, but whether you are truly determined to become one of the best saxophone players on the planet. Once you make up your mind, either come back here next Saturday or don't show up. And candidly, I don't care which one it is. And with that, he turned. I picked up my horn and left. So what am I going to decide? I'm either going to become one of the best saxophone players on the planet and therefore practice three hours a day, five days a week, or I'm not going to become one of the best saxophone players on the planet. Didn't matter what else I did after that. You understand. 
Merle knew what he was there to do. Two things, drink and teach. Drink and teach. Drink and teach. And anytime he was teaching, it took away from drinking. That was Merle Johnston. <laughs> and I stayed with the man for years. Practice, 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 practice. And I go up there every Saturday. And sometimes it just sounded terrible. And then suddenly something happened and the music showed up. And it blew my mind as Merle reached for his tenor saxophone and accompanied me, harmonizing with me whatever I was playing in the moment. The most extraordinary experience in the world. Every single one of you deserve that experience, but you got to earn it. And you got to earn it by concentration, discrimination, organization, innovation, communication, practicing, 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 plus everything else you've got to learn how to do to truly awaken the entrepreneur within, to truly awaken the creator within, to truly awaken the musician within, to truly awaken the part of you that is absolutely necessary if you're going to create something to transform the state of small business worldwide, which is what I'm committed to do at this age of 83.